Good morning and welcome to worship with us here at New Covenant Community Church in Akron, Ohio, as we endeavor to be the body of Christ to each other and to our fellow human beings around us. My name is Tom Ulrich, and on behalf of our congregation, I want to thank you for choosing to join us as we worship the one who is our hope, our guide, and our light. And our prayer is that God is keeping all of you safe and well during this time of wrestling with the pandemic. Because we are still not yet assembling for in-person services, we are grateful for your understanding, your flexibility, and your patience as we share these online opportunities. Today, with Ken Heishman's leadership, we'll have the joy of singing a couple of hymns, and we are also grateful to Fiona Coughlin, a member of the Allenside Presbyterian Church, for offering an anthem for our service. If you are on our email list, we trust that you receive the order of worship which not only contains the lyrics to the hymns, but it also includes the liturgy and the responsive readings we will share. If you are not on our email list and are interested in adding your name, we invite you to contact our church office or go to our church website at www.covenantakron.org. By doing so, you can also forward to us any prayer requests that you may have. But now, wherever we happen to be, let us worship our living Lord in spirit and in truth as we participate in the responsive call to worship, which is found in the bulletin that you received by email. The God we know in Jesus Christ walks the way of ordinary people. The God we know in Jesus Christ speaks to us in a language of grace and love. From all walks of life, God gathers us. From every place on earth, God invites us into a community of hope. People of every culture and country, of every time and territory, are called to follow the Lord. Let us embrace all that can be learned and all that can be done through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let us now sing together. new creations, blessed with new eyes to see God's vision, 
with new ears to hear God's word, and with new hearts to share God's love. However, as fallible human beings, our sin lures us to turn away from God's vision, to close our ears to God's truth, and to be motivated by selfishness rather than love. Yet God never gives up on us. And God calls us again to confess our sins so that they may be washed away by God's mercy. And we may be renewed and restored by the baptismal rivers of God's grace. Please join your hearts and your spirits in our corporate prayer of confession. And after our spoken prayer, we'll have a time to offer a time of, a, a, set, a time of silence to offer our own petitions to the Lord. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, although you summon us to follow a new course of life, we confess that we have frequently ignored your call. Through Jesus Christ, you have inaugurated a new order, but we remain enslaved to the world's ways. You have called us to pursue the vision of your kingdom, but the lure of earthly treasures has weakened our commitment. Forgive us, Lord, and set us again on the right path so that we may participate in your work of transformation and invest our lives in establishing your reign in all countries and continents through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, God saved us, but not because of any works of righteousness which we have done. God saved us according to the mercy of our Lord, through the water of rebirth and renewal through the Holy Spirit. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, Studying about that good old way And who shall wear the robe and crown Good Lord, show me the way All oh, people, let's go down Let's go down, come on down All oh, people, let's go down Down in the river to pray For those of us who are readers of Mark's Gospel We are quickly immersed in the ministry of Jesus. As soon as he is baptized, the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness for a period of 40 days. And when Jesus emerges from that experience, he has a message, a message about the kingdom of God, a message that he will proclaim across the Galilean countryside, and a message that he will invite other people to adopt and proclaim as they are also called to follow his way. From Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20, this is the word of the Lord. 
Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. God always blesses the reading and hearing of his holy word, and to God alone be the glory. Although I'm somewhat embarrassed to admit it, I must say that Edgar Guest is not my favorite poet. And I really don't think I stand alone in my distaste for Mr. Guest. In fact, I would venture to say that most preachers find him a little bit offensive. Now, I realize that some of you may not be familiar with Edgar Guest. And to be honest about it, I never had the opportunity to meet the man. But Edgar Guest was a rather popular poet in the early part of the 20th century. And yet through one of his poems, he has managed to humiliate most of us in the clergy. Because he is the one who wrote those cutting little lines, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. So can you understand while I'm not particularly fond of that fellow? He would rather not hear our sermons, not just on some days, but on any day. Now, I know that we preachers don't always produce eloquent masterpieces every week, but Mr. Guest wasn't even willing to listen to the small handful of sermons that might be somewhat tolerable. And while I admit that I'm probably overreacting to Mr. Guest, I will also concede that Edgar Guest has a point. After all, it's not always enough to speak the words. We have to embody the message. Or as we have heard on countless occasions, we have to practice what we preach. But if we think about it, even practicing what we preach is inadequate and sufficient because we really need to follow a higher ideal. And instead of practicing what we preach, we need to practice what Jesus preached. But the message which Jesus preached was no ordinary or commonplace message. For Mark tells us that in his very first sermon, Jesus announced the arrival of God's intervention into human history. Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God was being inaugurated. But not only did Jesus preach this sermon, he also practiced what he preached, declaring that the kingdom of God was being inaugurated not through just what he said, but by what he did. Not just in sermon, but in service. Not just with his message, but with his ministry. Not just with his words, but with his work. And so as soon as Jesus preached this sermon on the kingdom of God, he immediately began to embody that message as he invited others to share in the work. As Jesus, sauntering beside the sea, saw two brothers who were fishing, and he called them to follow. And they did. Then after going a little farther, Jesus saw two other brothers, James and John, who were also involved in the fishing, fishing business with their father and the hired servants. And Jesus called those brothers, and they too followed. And after Jesus had beckoned those brothers to break with business as usual and to leave behind everything that had been familiar to them, their families, their jobs, their homes, Jesus began his assault on the old order 
as the old world was being turned upside down. Oppressive institutions were beginning to get disruptive and, and the kingdom of God was beginning to evolve. In all that he said and did, Jesus would reveal through his message, through his miracles and through his ministry that participation in the kingdom of God involves practicing what Jesus preached. Joining Jesus in establishing a new world where we confront every form of oppression that dehumanizes or enslaves our brothers and sisters across the globe. And where we confront uh, a radical new hope that can be unleashed upon new, upon new ideas in human history where all exploitation is eliminated, where all abuse is abolished, and where all racism is eradicated. By practicing what Jesus preached, we demonstrate that we are willing to separate ourselves from our safe and secure surroundings in order to follow Christ to a new reality where justice triumphs over injustice, where love conquers hate, and where we are called to participate in God's new world that can pre completely transcends the old order. Some time ago, John Scully wrote a book entitled Odyssey, a book which traced his steps from the corporate presidency of Pepsi-Cola to a high-level management position with the Apple Computer Company. During his tenure as president of Pepsi, for the first time in history, they outsold Coca-Cola for the year. And consequently, not only was their product a high, but John Scully was also quickly becoming one of the most prominent individuals in the business world. At that point, a man named Steve Jobs approached John Scully about coming to work for Apple Computer. As the two men talked, Steve Jobs beautifully displayed the virtues of the Apple Corporation. And after a great deal of discussion, Steve Jobs asked directly, so, are you going to come to Apple? John Scully replied, Steve, I really admire what you're doing, and I'm excited about it, but it doesn't make sense for me to come with you. Steve Jobs countered, Now look, even if, even if I have to pay your salary out of my own pocket, I want you to come to Apple. But again, John Scully didn't waver. Steve, I'd love to be an advisor for you, to help you in any way, but I don't think I can join you. But then Steve Jobs issued the challenge that would haunt John Scully for days. He said, John, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water, or do you want a chance to change the world? Do you want a chance to change the world? Because a similar challenge is addressed to us. For when Jesus calls us to follow, as he did those first disciples, we are also summoned to participate in the transformation of the world by practicing what Jesus preached. And by practicing what Jesus preached, we demonstrate that we are willing to follow Christ and immerse ourselves in the sea of society so that one day justice will roll down like the waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. By practicing what Jesus preached, we demonstrate through our words and our work that we are willing to invest ourselves in building the kingdom of God, a kingdom established on the foundation of God's future, a kingdom ventilated by God's vision, a kingdom growing by God's grace. By practicing what Jesus preached, we demonstrate that we are willing to join Jesus on his journey. Well, we will no longer accept a world which tolerates the unjust and senseless death of any human being, but instead we commit ourselves to work for the life of all creation. And where we will no longer sanction a society which marginalizes people because of one's economic standing or one's ethnic origin or one's religious affiliation or one's sexual orientation. 
but instead we are willing to work for a community of dignity and dialogue, of equality and inclusion, of hope and of harmony. By practicing what Jesus preached, we demonstrate that we are willing to follow Jesus, not out of the world, but into the world. And not just to announce the dawn of God's kingdom, but to embody the message by reordering our own priorities, by seeking new insights from Christ's teachings, and by contributing to the cause of Christ. Yes, my friends, even though at times it may seem foolish, and even though at times it may seem useless, nevertheless, it is the task of the church, of the disciples of Jesus Christ, to bear witness to the kingdom that God proclaims. For it is only in carrying out this mission that the kingdom of God is revealed. In his book, The Contemplative Pastor, Eugene Peterson wrote how he used to bristle when some high-powered business executive would shake hands with him at the church door and then say, nice sermon, Pastor, but now it's back to the real world, isn't it? Peterson always wanted to shake such people and remind them that the world to which worship and preaching directs our hearts and minds, that is the real world. And even now, another kingdom is being formed among us to take its place. And we are called to introduce people to this real world and to train them to live in it. Because today, the real world is waiting for, yearning for, dying for, disciples of our Lord to practice what Jesus preached in order to reveal that the kingdom of God is at hand. And even though we may feel as if our efforts are futile, and even though it may seem that the old order is too entrenched, and even though it may seem that nothing we do makes a difference, nevertheless, wherever our words and our work instill dignity and respect for every human being, wherever our lives and our language help to refashion relationships of justice and equality, and wherever our message of Christ and our ministry for Christ create hope in the hearts of humanity, then the kingdom of God has begun to dawn. And regardless of how we may feel, when God's new world appears on the horizon, then all people will realize that the church that disciples of Jesus Christ and that you have been practicing what Jesus preached. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
us go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. God of peace, who casts your nets so wide that you seek to draw everyone into your haven of love, and who summons us to renew our worship with service and to fortify our service with worship, as you walk with us on the path of life, equip us to embody your love in every action we take and in every word we say. Grant that we would be united in your truth, committed in our discipleship and sanctified by your grace, so that with one heart and one voice we would proclaim your gospel in word and deed, praising you for your abiding presence in our midst. Instill within us a fresh capacity to see your hope throughout all the earth and empower us to spread the good news that your realm is near, to share your vision in this time and place, and to reflect your light in the world. Amid all the brokenness of our world, plagued by the pandemics of disease, race, and political divisions, lead your church, we pray, on the way of hope and wholeness as we lift up to you those in our world who weep, as well as those of us who cause their weeping. Embrace those of us without food, clothing, shelter, or a means of sustaining life, and redeem those of us who distort the good news of the gospel and who make gods out of things, out of themselves, and out of their systems, institutions, or structures. Pour out your spirit on all those who are suffering, especially as we lift to you our own needs and the needs of those whose lives are closely linked with our own. For this morning, we pray for one of our members whose brother passed away in Chicago. We pray for all people on the planet, neighbors and strangers, as we wrestle with the coronavirus pandemic. And we pray for our elected leaders as they seek discernment to grapple with the enormous challenges we face. Impart your healing to all wounds. Bring wholeness to all that is broken. Speak truth to all illusion. And shed light in every darkness. As we look for ways to participate in your life-changing work in the world, keep us open to the unfolding of all that can be celebrated all that can be learned, all that can be done, and all that can be without diminishing the life of others. Give us wisdom when we forget to learn from what history has taught us. Enrich us with newness when we have closed our hearts to your future. And fill us with joy when we see the breadth of your creativity expressed in the diversity among us. For we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught his disciples when praying to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God blesses us with gifts, not so that we would heed and hoard God's grace, but so that we would share these gifts with our fellow human beings. For by sharing our gifts, we can become a blessing to the world around us. Even now, your generous donations are making a difference in the world. For your gifts serve the Central American Medical Outreach, which provides thousands of life-saving services each year to impoverished people who would otherwise not have access to aid. Your gifts also support Project HOPE, which provides direct health care services, equips clinics and hospitals, and trains local health officials in vulnerable areas where disasters strike. Today, human lives are indeed being touched and transformed by the offerings you share. And may these gifts indeed give light to those who are in darkness, hope to those in despair, and justice to the oppressed, as we bring them before God as an act of sharing God's love with the world. On this day, 
Let us give our gifts in order to contribute to the kingdom of God and in gratitude for what has been and what may be. And may God bless you as you give. And now, my friends, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and sharing with one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love this day and forevermore.